So hello all, this is uh, the Peerless Communities Fiction Panel, and today we have four different panelists. Uh, I'm going to go ahead and just kind of go down the room, or go around the virtual room, and have everybody introduce themselves. Uh, Amanda, if you could kick us off. Oh, hi. Um, I'm Amanda Price. I'm from the UK, and I'm um, one of the founders of a cybersecurity human factor company uh, called Layer 8 Limited. Fantastic. Uh, David? Okay, thanks. Hello, everyone. My name is David Bieren. I'm phoning in from South Africa. Uh, thank you for this opportunity to talk about a subject that I'm just starting to learn I'm very interested in. Oh, and I'm a and counselor Eric. for city municipality. It's a political job. Thank okay. you. I'm Eric Klein. Uh, I've been involved with telecom fraud prevention for the last number of years in telecom for the last 25. Um, I'm calling in from Israel. Dean, would you like to uh, introduce yourself to us? Sure. Thanks, Brent. Uh, I am Dean Webb, and I have been in InfoSec for uh, 12 years now, and I have been a teacher, uh, high school and junior high in the USA, for 16 years, and I've been writing fiction uh, sort of semi-seriously since uh, the late 90s, and I've I've always enjoyed writing it to, when I was teaching English to be able to do the creative process along with my students. And then once I got back into IT again, I looked around and I felt there's so many cool story ideas just emerging from uh, daily observations, hearing snips of conversation, just thinking about developments in technology. I just started writing again with an emphasis on uh, in, information security, and I've just been running with that now for the last two years. Uh, I'm your uh, moderator. This is uh, Brent Hutkless. All right. So uh, as far as is writing, what genres do you write for, and who is your intended audience? Fantastic. Not a problem. Uh, would you like me to start? I don't know. Go for it. Absolutely. Anybody. Thank okay. you. Um, I'm pretty new to this, uh, so the, the three genres that I like to pull from the most uh, are Star Trek, Game of Thrones, and Matrix. I think I use Star Trek for more moral messaging, uh, Game of Thrones for your political and Machiavellian messaging, and I like throwing in the Matrix there just to tell people how it is without them realizing it. So those, those, that would be the genres I like playing in. Okay, I'm, I'm happy to go next if you like. Um, uh, my company deals with uh, changing behaviours, making um, employee behaviours more secure. And so um, the fiction I write um, is actually highly influenced by the fact that my first career was in theatre. Uh, so I tend to use that to try and bring cyber to life for people. Um, I write for employees in a business environment, so they're the, uh, the frontline defenders of business assets. And my work will reach them either as part of an app that the business has subscribed to, as part of a workshop that the business has brought in. So I write naturalistic scenarios that demonstrate how difficult it is to make secure decisions on a day-to-day -day basis. And these are either performed in a workshop or they're viewed as a video pro featuring professional performers. So it's a bit like creating a problem page scenario that blends personal and cyber together. Okay, and, and I guess I'm kind of odd man out here. I actually write nonfiction, uh, having done several books in fiction, uh, have a science fiction novel coming out, uh, predominantly targeting people who are into reality in the science fiction. Uh, but in the past, uh, like David, I, I've done a number of lectures where going in and, and pulling in, um, my favorite actually is from Spaceballs. The actual um, password used for the security, uh, the, the air shield uh, up, ends up in about one out of every three presentations I make. I really like writing the uh, hard science fiction, unless it has to be completely ludicrous to make a point. Um, 
I really enjoy the styles of writers like uh, Stanislav Lem from Poland, who took a similar approach. He was using it to point out some of the uh, paradoxes within the communist world as well as within the human experience. I like to point up the paradoxes inherent in the marketing claims that we get about how everything will be bigger, better, faster, stronger, and our whites will be wider and our brights will be brighter with technology. There's always going to be some other unintended consequence, and my fiction is able to explore that. And I like writing for for a general audience just to give them ideas about what could happen that they should be skeptical uh, of claims that everyone should be trusting but verifying. And when I write for the InfoSec community itself, I think it's a way to launch a discussion to where we can postulate a scenario, a hypothetical in the fiction story, and then if it's not too far-fetched, we then can think, you know, how would we deal with such an incident? How can we prepare ourselves against that? What are the vulnerabilities being shown here? What do we need to do to protect? So it, it, all of it is, is just to ask, you know, uh, going back to Socrates, where he said the unexamined life isn't worth living, I would say the unexamined technology isn't worth implementing. How do you make content believable for the knowledgeable reader without losing a less technical audience? And uh, Amanda, would you like to start us off? Okay, um, well, because I'm focusing on uh, users and um, the human element in cybersecurity, I create believable scenarios in which employees are tricked into giving away information or into sharing passwords, or, or are just making mistakes in the course of their everyday work. Often the scenarios include moments where emotional triggers are pushed by a social engineer. And if I'm in a workshop, I'll get the participants to consider their own triggers and to direct the performance for themselves as a way of discovering how to outwit the scammers. So I'm often dealing less with technical aspects of cybersecurity and more with behaviors around devices um, in an everyday setting. That's very interesting. Um, my writing is pretty late at the moment because I'm experimenting. Uh, the, the general idea of, of my writing, though, is to plant uh, what I call thought germs, something I learned from CCP Gray. Um, that's for the more technical reader, and then normally I'm, I like putting in something that I know a more advanced reader will understand and only they will get. So um, normally when I create something, I try and uh, approach it with several different messages on several different layers, depending on who's reading it. Uh. I actually try to make the security a factor in the story. So what is going on and how they have to do it. You can't get into the technical bits and bytes. You have to kind of give a feel for what's happening. Because in looking ahead 100 years, the rules will be different. So you can't get too detailed into it. So you have to set up the believable scenario with a believable solution without actually getting into a whole problem of exactly the bits and bytes level of fixing it. And that's good sci-fi. It makes uh, it a challenge. Yep. Yeah. The, the key is something that every good fiction writer is told constantly, is pounded in their head, show, don't tell. I've There are plenty of bad science fiction movies in the 1950s where they take a five-minute break to explain a technology, <laughs> and it just loses everybody in the audience. That's when you throw popcorn at the screen. It's like, ah, la, 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 it sounds like math. You don't want that. So, But by showing the effects and the impacts of it, then people are able to understand. They're able to make the connection. Something bad happened or something good happened. I don't know how exactly, but apparently this is technologically possible. And if it's in a familiar enough environment, then it's all the more believable. So if I have, say, for example, a teenage daughter walk into her dad and ask to go to somebody's house, the dad says, no, I don't really approve of you visiting those people. Okay, this is a, a common enough 
occurrence here. Something is objectionable. Is the dad being justified or is he being unjustified? And then the daughter stamps her foot. It only happened that one time. And dad says, yes, but we had to get rid of all of your wearable tech because they don't patch over there. You know how I feel about those people, those kinds of people. So now we have a new kind of prejudice introduced here. Oh, you know, those Johnsons, they don't patch. I don't like you hanging out with them. So she says, well, what if I put all my clothes on airplane mode? Okay, now dad can make a compromise here. So now, but just, you know, I didn't say which pieces of clothing she has. She just said all my clothes on airplane mode. Now we know we're in a world where, yes, wearable tech is a is everywhere. It's the socks, it's the shoes, it's the pants, it's everything. Um, in fact, I was shopping last night, and there were there's like hats with Bluetooth speakers built into them. For <laughs> like, well, there you go. That was my story. Put your hat on airplane mode, you know, <laughs> before you go over to your friend's house. And so now we, we I, instead of telling people, you know, the dad was concerned because they didn't pay. He just says, oh, they don't pass. So you reveal a lot. You do a lot of telling or she's a lot of showing with dialogue, with actions, with reactions. And uh, through that, they're able to understand what the technology is. People like to use their imaginations as they read and to show what's going on through action and dialogue allows that imagination to fill in the gaps that a user manual would otherwise be appropriate if you're in an actual setting. Although I said that and I thought there's no way you can make a user manual entertaining and then that gave me a story idea for uh, someone who has a user manual that's so over the top for the security tool that, <laughs> that the user manual itself becomes interesting because it is so like, wait a minute, you know, why do I have to do this when I in install your product? You know, he has to create four shell companies before he can, uh, you know, install the ISO. So it's like, whoa. <laughs> now, you're interested. You want to know more about this weird product he's got to put in. So, you know, yeah. It, and I think that's the last part there. There are a lot of rules in fiction, and you have to know all of them, and you have to be good with them before you even start to break them. The, the new writer breaks the rules and it's terrible. The experienced writer breaks the rules and it's brilliant. So, you know, it's an art. <laughs> Do you prefer to use uh, known exploits, tools, and, and hacker capabilities in your stories? Or, or do you like to create frightening new possibilities to uh, engage your, uh, your audience? And uh, David, wh why don't you uh, lead us off with this one? Um, at the moment, I, I think I, I'm still learning a lot of the existing exploits and systems out there. But um, I don't know if I, I like to create frightening new tools but I, 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 or, or stories, um, but I think I like to create very interesting and captivating ones. Um, so I'm definitely still still learning when it comes to that. And um, as mentioned earlier on, I generally don't get too technical when talking. Uh, when I wrote that story, Chasing Sammy, for instance, I used the term t um, magic to unlock the phone. Uh, the how is not as important as the what. So I think, Amanda, it's your turn to answer the question. Okay, then. Um, well, very often the, uh, the starting point for the scenarios that I write is the, uh, is the germ of the story we've been told by one of our clients or partners. And um, I mean, the stories that we work with are pretty scary. Um, so I don't often feel the need to create frightening new person uh, possibilities. Um, and um, the stories are all highly dramatic because they use emotional vulnerabilities. So um, just as um, the previous speaker was saying, you know, uh, you know the tech, can age and date, but actually the way we humans respond um, tends to stay fresh because we're always going to be curious, we're always going to want to please, we're always going to fall for those age-old scams that sit at the heart of every social engineering hack that we're likely to encounter. So we always find that um, our viewers and participants always really appreciate being the given the opportunity to actually see um, how a scam works, and to see the impact of that scam, or whether it's phishing, ransomware, or person-to-person -person social engineering, to see what the impact is on a victim. 
um, because that's something we don't hear about too often in the headlines, which tend to be about the, you know, the, the sort of high end um, vulnerabilities and hacks. So our audience is end users, so we keep the scenarios recognizable for them. Thank you, Eric. Um, I tend to find that, the, as Amanda said, people are still people regardless of when and where you're writing about. So the social engineering, the phishing kinds of things are the easiest ones to use without having to get into scary technical things or things that might happen in the future. I have done one panel where I went and I started using some of the scary things in the future of well, what happens when we get to data streams that are basically transporters of people or objects and somebody wants to hack or inject into that or things of that nature trying to, to draw out a little bit more of the we need to be more careful in the future trying to scare people but based on what they understand from today it really is still human beings making the same stupid mistakes today that we made in the 50s and 60s why assume that 100 years from now we won't still be doing the same thing? Yes, that's absolutely it. <laughs> Very good point. Kind of depressing, but realistic, I guess. No, I agree. And Dean, you know, you, you gave mm -hmm. a good example with the with the wearables. Mm -hmm. uh, which which is your preference? Kind of the what we have today, or something uh, new and frightening for tomorrow? I, you know, it, it, both of them are, are rich fields. If it's right on the edge, if it's something where I think, you know what, this is about to be big, you know, we, we have like a little trickle of problem with it now, this could be a, a much bigger thing later on. I, but that's the one I like to write because that's the one where there's the most possibility and the most ability, I think, for people to think of how we react to it. But at the same time, taking our existing problems, particularly in the field of uh, national security or military technology, taking current problems there and showing how they play out are ones where it's, to, to me, that becomes less fictional, if you will, and more it's happening somewhere where I'll, I'll get a I'll write the story and I get a comment where someone says you know that happened to me not five months ago or three years ago I was over here and I saw something like that I'm like wow you know I, I didn't I was kind of pushing the edge when I wrote it but it was it seemed plausible to me uh, so for a lot of my current problem things of course there's there's plenty of tech journals out there but I also like reading uh, military industry journals so I can see what's going on there because I, I think putting it in that context makes it even more urgent to the viewer. Uh, you know, back to the case with the daughter with the wearables. Uh, okay, you know, that's a family problem. If it gets hacked, we buy a new hat or something. But what if it's a, a group of soldiers in the field and all their wearable technology is compromised? Then we have an enemy that they're working against that is able to exploit that, and now it would, does that affect us here at home? Does that affect our friends, our neighbors? It it becomes more urgent there. Uh, as and it really, as far as speculation goes, I don't want to go too far into, into the future. Uh, if I'm dealing with uh, intelligent cars, I'm taking a projection from auto industry experts saying within the next five to ten years here is what we'll see in driving technology improvements or changes and I want to take that projection and, and look at what could be going on with that uh, I wouldn't want to go you know a thousand years in the future unless it, again it is just science fantasy where it's just a big question hey what if there was a huge artificial intelligence super brain and it did X what would happen to humanity, huh? You know, those are nice little noodlings, but the ones I really find most engaging are ones where they connect and they interface with our current time frame in some fashion. Uh, 
What would you say is the hardest part about writing uh, about information or cybersecurity as compared to uh, regular fiction or even uh, nonfiction? Eric, do you want to start us off? My biggest problem with that tends to be insecurity or of any kind, cybersecurity included, is I don't want to write something that feels like it could be turned around and used as a recipe or a user's guide later on. So trying to keep it believable enough without being close enough to the truth that somebody could actually try it is a very fine line to kind of walk. So this is the hardest thing I find in writing this stuff. One of the things that um, <laughs> drives me up the wall sometimes is the fact that the actual action of um, somebody making a mistake tends to be very undramatic. So somebody clicking on a phishing link is very hard to, to actually dramatize. And I'm dealing with performance and film as an medium. Um, so what we tend to work with um, in, at Layer 8 is um, we work with generic scenarios. So there's one that we do about someone leaving a building and then someone else trying to gain entry to that building without having um, you know, the ID they need and the pass. And um, so it goes through quite a, a, you know, an exchange, a piece of dialogue. It, the, it's dramatic. The, the guy who's trying to get away has got to get back because he's got to get to the hospital. The person who's trying to get in has got a very good story about why they haven't got the pass, why they need to get in. They appear to know the person that they're asking. Um, you never quite know whether this is a social engineer or not. So we're, I'm always looking for um, you know, very physical representations of those mistakes that we're all in danger of making every single day. And that, for me, is the biggest challenge. But on the other hand, there's something so exciting about writing about this, because nobody else is. You know what I mean? It's, we're right at the beginning of this genre. Um, so really, you, you know, you, you've got a, a blank canvas, and you're making up the rules as you go along. It's a very exciting time to be a part of this. Okay, um, a concern I have here is that the wrong reader takes my work literally. Um, infosec writing is hard emotionally to do. I don't think many people would like to write about what I write about if they knew what I was inspired by. Um, many people think that they, they want to write infosec, infosec fiction, and it's something like you'd read by Ian Fleming, where it's an author that involves beautiful women, hotels, casinos, and martinis when in reality it re really leads to dark alleys, darker people, and depression so heavy, it feels like a physical waste. They kind of expect golden finger when they should be expecting the human centipede. <laughs> That's really cool. Oh. And I thought I was depressed. <laughs> I'm so, so desperate. <laughs> I, I think Amanda was right, though. Part of this is the click isn't dramatic. Life doesn't come with that soundtrack with a dum 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 when somebody does something <laughs> stupid. And there are times you really wish it did. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, it, it's difficult to try and, and make this believable and exciting when, and you, you look at the TV programs and taking CSI or something, and they take what is effectively a month-long process, and they try to make it look like it takes 20 minutes. Yeah. Um, cybersecurity is the same thing. It's very rare that you can go and click three buttons and come up with an answer uh, in five minutes. It takes hours and hours of data analysis and looking at clues and looking at logs and checking the details. And even then, you may never be able to identify exactly what was done or by who. Um, the real world examples that I'm finding are much scarier than anything I've seen in fiction. And I'm only talking telecom. I'm not even talking people hacking into credit cards or bank systems or bitcoins and stuff. Um, so it, it tends to be scary and trying to make it believable by saying, okay, and then they go and look at the logs to check the details and stuff. Uh, David's right. It makes for very boring fiction. But this is, this is where the reality comes in. So you have to put a little in if you want to be believable. No, uh, uh, very, very good point. <laughs> uh, like
like making it sound more mundane so it's more believable. <laughs> and yet, you know, there is a, a, an intrinsic drama there. I mean, I, I was just talking to a group of employees yesterday um, who were saying, yeah, we were trying to, we were talking about clean desks, which is so dull, you know. Um, but um, they were saying, I and after quite a long conversation, um, they said, I just don't see why. Why do I need a clean desk? And then, finally, we arrived at the story. And once a story could be put in place, um, somebody said, okay, right. Okay, so imagine you've left this on your desk. That could be picked up and that could be used like this. And then that could be linked up with this. And everybody was suddenly absolutely engaged. And there was sort of a neural pathway being made there where everybody saw exactly how this worked and why it was so important just to clear your desk, which is so mundane and so problematic. Um, but I think that's where it becomes powerful. Um, you know, there, it, the, so much of this is dull work but actually the stakes are very high um, for us as humans. And that's what makes it important that we deal with it and deal with it in fiction. No, and I think you bring up a good point about the uh, pattern recognition mm. and just being able to tie all of the different pieces of information together. Mm. I think that the hardest the hardest thing to do with that is to, number one, resist the urge to tell. And then the second most difficult urge to resist is the one to start preaching. We want people to make it to, to move to action. But I really believe that that move to action needs to be uh, organic to the person themselves, that it cannot be one that we impose on them. And if I start getting preachy in a book, I lose interest. Suddenly, if, if my character is standing up on a soapbox and he's pounding his fist about TLS version 1.3, well, I, I've lost it there. I've become, I'm, I'm writing a rant on a message board somewhere. Uh, <laughs> so, you know, it, it, there's that. And there's also, thinking, how do I make this into a story that has a beginning, a middle, and the end? Uh, I don't want to just describe a situation and then drop a cow on it and say, there, you know, boom, it's over. Uh, I need to have an arc in these stories. And some, some things lend themselves to very brief stories, less than a thousand words, flash fiction, most of what I write on, I think, works best as a short story because in a short story, you're actually able to allow the the little technology that you're dealing with to be a character of sorts. That the resol You don't have to give any development to the humans in there. You're developing the technology, the thinking about that. But technology itself doesn't really have a lot of legs to it. It, you know... I know people can say, well, artificial intelligence does yes, but uh, a firewall or an IPS, typically no. You, <laughs> you said it and forget it. So, so if I want to write something longer, then I need to have a situation in which I'm able to begin to explore deeper questions. Uh, there's one that I'm working on right now that I want to be able to look at what is the difference between corporate surveillance and state surveillance. Uh, and what happens if the two begin to overlap? What if we blur those edges? So, because I do see some of this going on around me and I do want to ask the question. So I, I, I set up a slightly ludicrous environment so the focus is less on the technology and more on the question about the technology. Uh, and at the same time, I can give the technology a little magical edge to it by leaving a lot more to the imagination there. And so you just leave that to the side, okay, technology, I'm not going to understand this, but the argument about it, you know, this is something I can deal with because of my own experience with my own technologies at work and what I hear on the news. So. It becomes relatable that way. 
Um, but definitely knowing when to end a story. I, th I think that would be the third biggest struggle that we have. We don't want to write too much, ever. And although you get paid more by the word, <laughs> art, art is, I, I believe the, the best I've ever heard was, you know, art is what's left after you're done with all the editing. And that's what you present. If you don't edit it enough, it ain't art yet. So, <laughs> well, that's good. And that uh, goes pretty well with uh, what uh, Amanda had had talked about, uh, and, and others, where you're you're you have a lot of uh, I guess human condition that is relatable mm -hmm. within storytelling, whether it's. 50 years ago or 200 years in the future, people will be making the same type of mistakes regardless. Mm -hmm. Or dealing with the same, or, or actually dealing with the same problems. Uh, I think this is where a good knowledge of history helps. Uh, you, you look at, you know, what would a, an enemy want to do to the United States now? Cut up our technology, you know, cut up our access to information if there was a war. Well, 100 years ago at the start of World War I, the first thing the British did after the Germans declared war on them was to sail out into the English Channel, pick up the telegraph cable that brought all the traffic to Germany, severed it, and Germany was blinded at that point. Now, it's, it's, not, as, it's not the same technology that we have today, but it's the same idea. Cut that information source. Boom. <laughs> so, yeah, you're right. We have the same problems through history. It's you know how do we deal with them with the with the new wrinkles we get with our techn our current technologies. Absolutely, and it keeps it relatable, mm -hmm. probably across the centuries. <laughs> yeah. So does anyone ever fear that their plots are going to be used by criminals? And I think we touched on this a little bit in some of the responses, but. Uh, just as an author, would you fear that uh, you know your storyline would ever be picked up by a criminal enterprise, and and then maybe uh, law enforcement would come knocking at your door to find out if you had any type of connection? Speaking for myself, I've got a list of I will never write them because uh, they fall into that category. Um, so no, nothing I've actually written do I worry that somebody's going to turn around and make real. They're all the ones that I refuse to write. I'm just desperate to know what's on that list. <laughs> Immediately. <laughs> <laughs> Those are the ones I want to read. <laughs> That's the problem. It's like the, the ones that are most believable and most scary mm. are the ones that will, will probably sell the best. Yeah. Um, but some of the things I know or have read or could combine, um, take Frank Herbert's White Plague, for example. Mm. He wrote an absolutely lovely novel about a biochemist whose wife and daughter get killed by terrorists, and he decides that if he can't have his women, then nobody should have theirs, and he goes out and does everything and explains how he creates it, how he creates the vector, how he spreads a virus around the world as a physical, everybody gets sick kind of virus. Mm -hmm. And it's like, there's just enough truth in there that I could see somebody actually trying to make it work. Mm -hmm. And those kind of things scare me. In a day when we've got cyber terror, we've got real terror, we've got people running around with uranium and uh, all sorts of fun things, sticking the dark web into your thing is kind of this nebulous, scary place where people do horrible things is bad enough. Telling yeah. people how to get into it or what to look for, that to me goes beyond the realm of responsible writing. Uh, but that would be the much more fun stories to write. <laughs> yeah. Um, I found that's why I like that Star Trek uh, genre, especially when you're trying to uh, dis discuss something that you really can't discuss without adding a lot of risk or, or, or raising someone's risk analysis on you. 
um, is 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 that's why I like things like Star Trek because I can I dig into things like the Borg, which is like a huge cybernetic species trying to take over and assimilate um, st- Starfleet. So so that's why I think like the, those fantasy genres they allow you to explore the absurd right in front of people without them realizing it. Uh, that's it. That, that actually goes for its Independence Day, and we're going to infect the aliens with a Windows XP virus. Hmm. It's like everybody believed it because everybody knew exactly what kinds of things happened on Microsoft, but that was as far as the believability went. And it's interesting, isn't it? That That's how we've always used science fiction as a genre, is to talk about things we're finding really difficult in the present moment. Uh, so to put them in the future and just be able to take an objective look at them. It, and it's fascinating. Uh, yeah, that's the difference between science fiction and science fantasy. Science fiction can maybe uh, one day become science fact. Mm. Science fantasy is just drama. Yeah. We had so, a, quite an interesting um, situation happen a few months ago, we, we often um, include an exercise when we're doing workshops where we ask employees to uh, think about how they would hack their own company. Um, because we're, we're asking them to think about vulnerabilities. Um, and we always say, you know where the vulnerabilities are. You know, um, We want you to bring your expertise to the table here and tell us, you know, what would be the way to hack this business? And suddenly an employee put, put his hand out and he said, look, he said, you're social engineers, aren't you? You know, this is all a big plot, isn't it? And so there was suddenly this conspiracy theory um, going around the room. Thankfully, we uh, obviously had signed an NDA. Um, but it went so far because people in the room just had this real sense that, you know, something awful could be about to happen here, um, that um, the, the NDA had to be produced uh, for everybody to believe it. Um, but it was a great session, actually, because what it did was really raise awareness about the fact that, you know, we have to be careful about what we talk about and how we talk about it, especially if it's with people that we don't know, you know, that are third parties that are outsourced or whatever. Um, so it was a really interesting one. Uh, we didn't see it coming at all. We're always very careful about that now. And we produce the NDA before we even start talking. Uh, to be honest, I think that that's a mistake. Mm. You probably got a significantly more interested audience and more involved <laughs> yeah. when they when they were sitting there worrying about what's real because that actually made it personal, not just yeah. hypothetical. Absolutely, and absolutely. Getting the kind of response where the audience is going, wait a second, are we actually allowed to be having this conversation with you? Is yeah. it going to cost me my job? Mm. Actually means that they're thinking. Yeah. And that's, a much better group for the kind of things that you're looking for than the people who are just sitting there nodding their head and pretending not to be looking at their cell phone. Yeah, that's a really interesting point that you make. Um, uh, yes, yes, actually. And um, I will absolutely take that on board because, of course, we're just trying to avoid that same situation where it might be really useful to have that situation happening. Um, and it was great to see everybody running around really in, in, in a state of heightened tension um, to be able to, to try and produce this NDA. Um, because, uh, yeah, it absolutely brought it under the noses of absolutely everybody in the room. And that included our, employee, our employers at that company. Uh, Amanda, that sounds like a very interesting plot line just uh, for some fiction uh, writing yeah. in the future. <laughs> I got involved in talking about this kind of thing by getting dragged onto a panel because one of the, the panel members had uh, canceled out uh, due to a death in the family. And I got pulled onto a panel on telecom fraud uh, in 2011. And we had somebody get up in the audience and say, my company was hacked uh, two days, $400,000. And that evening, after we, went, we finished the session and we were sitting in the hotel bar, one of the people in the audience walked up to me and said, you scared the fucking hell out of me. Literally, you scared the shit out of me. And it's like, if this is not the response that you're getting from people from these kinds of things mm. in real world settings, let alone in fiction, then we're not leaving the right kind of message because we want people to be scared. 
Because scared yeah. means that they're actually thinking about it. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. But fear can lead to anger uh, if you push it too far. So you must be careful about uh, where you, where you, you balance that fear. Well, in Amanda's case, it's how can you hack your company? You want them to be afraid into thinking about it. And in this case, it sounded like they had gotten a little confrontational, which is where she mm. had to step back and produce the NDA. Mm. So you're right. It, it, it's a, a fine line of getting them involved and holding them back. And in fiction, it's harder because your audience isn't physically in front of you. Mm. You're imagining how they're going. To, the real person is going to react when they read this, and you don't want them to just get annoyed and throw it away. Yeah, I think one of the things we're, we're um, battling with at the moment is that headlines are all in bold in capital letters and are using very scary phrases at the moment. So that the people we come across sort of who are working in everyday jobs dealing with cybersecurity at the boring end, if you like, um, have, a lot of them have been turned off by the um, hyperbole that is around cybersecurity at the moment. So I completely agree with what you're saying. You know, this is a very fine line that we're treading, and we've got to be very careful to include as many people as possible in this sort of, you know, global conversation that we're having at the moment. That is a always a, a specter. Do you make it too elaborate? Do you go for it? Uh, I am of the opinion that we have been fortunate as a planet in that the the worst possible scenarios have only been created by actual governments. Consider the Second World War. That was not a small band of criminals. That was perpetrated by entire armies, ordered by entire governments. So you know, our worst disasters are not small bands of criminals. And that being said, I think some of our worst cyber disasters are ones where we don't have small gangs doing things here and there. We have large companies choosing to meet compliance the day before the auditor shows up. We have governments that make exceptions for themselves that they would normally you know, shut down somebody else's business for if they had that same violation. Uh, but that being said, if I do create a situation in which I want to have a small band of criminals exploiting something and go for a more poignant human tragedy, I think we need to be aware that there are so many other things that could be done, so many other vulnerabilities out there that we really ought to be sensitive about. Um, I don't want to give specific details on how to set everything up in an operation, but I have actually gone through, I had one set of stories about what would happen if a group of criminals took some cars that would normally pass through an airport un, unchecked, un, unconcerned about because they're, they're owned by the airport, but what if they compromised them and had uh, high-speed mortars in them and they were launching off of a computerized uh, flight plan. And then the mortars were lobbing shells directly onto the tarmac, onto terminals, onto fuel dumps at an airport. Uh, now that is a pretty specific idea and it's out there. What can we do to protect ourselves against that? What if the, what if the security at the airport is something that can be gone completely around. And, and this is something that we, we've had to ask for a long time. We have security theater in many places. How do we step up our game? How do we do something better than that? How do we get to where we don't take so many things for granted? And at the same time, how do we also avoid alert fatigue? This, these are, I think, the two biggest questions we have in security. What do we take for granted and how do we avoid alert fatigue? We need to think about those things so we can improve our security overall. So Amanda had had mentioned uh, using social engineering, you know, with with her role at her current uh, company or organization, mm -hmm. and you know where she was, uh, she and and others on her team were presenting to an organization, and uh, the organization became, of course. 
a little concern that maybe they were being social engineered at that very moment and, and mm -hmm. had uh, had that organization, Amanda's organization, present the NDA to prove that they weren't actually uh, hackers or the bad guys there to <laughs> uh, compromise the organization from within uh, using using the team. And I think mm -hmm. that the question that triggered it was, uh, all of you know your your environment and mm -hmm. everything very well. Uh, what would you do if you were a hacker? You know, how would you take advantage of, of the company or, or hack the company? <laughs> and, and that kind of triggered uh, this this next scenario. What? Any any follow up or, yeah. or thoughts around that? Uh, I think absolutely. Uh, the fiction of paranoia is alive and well and living in infosec fiction. It, it is very easy to ask the question and then to expect you know a set of russian dolls where there's there's another layer you you pull this one up there's another layer there's another layer there's another oh my gosh when does it stop um and um it is it, it is one where we do have to ask the question who can we who who can we trust and is I think this is something that I go back to. If I have social engineering, it tends to be the marketer himself that's promising this product is going to be amazing. And that is social engineering. Get this product in the house. Get the sale. What about the security implications? That might affect sales. Don't mention those. <laughs> that's social engineering. Uh, <laughs> so that's very true. I, I, and we want to believe. We, we, we want to think that Yes, this advertiser is being honest, and he's not a snake oil salesman. He's not a, a you know some kind of hype merchant. But all too often, that is what happens. We have somebody that promises us everything that we need, and it'll be bigger, better, faster, stronger. And then, whoops, you know, you have an unpatched Apache server running underneath all this. It, it doesn't matter how fast it is. My competition has planted a bot in there, and they're getting a copy of every little transaction we have. So, uh, yeah, there, there definitely is a lot of paranoia. And, and that, that's another area of fiction I like to write that's not necessarily di directly related to information security, but instead a character thrust into a situation where uh, not only is, is he and everybody around him trying to present some kind of facade, but they also have some kind of internal – some motivation to try to undermine everybody else in the group. Uh, sort of like imagine if you're in a totalitarian society where everyone must love the computer, okay, but at the same time everybody is a member of, of a secret society that's dedicated to overthrowing the computer, but all these secret societies are at odds with each other, so they're also dedicated to overthrowing each other. So what do you what if you have a room of ten people, each a member of a different secret society, and then they're all being trained on how to operate a hand weapon to be used to destroy the enemies of the computer? You know, if it accidentally discharges, was that really an accident? You know? <laughs> if someone was written up for being a traitor and disobedient, were they really being a traitor? Or <laughs> and then it gets. It could, it, you can go down so many fun rabbit holes, but at the same time, the reader and the really me, the writer, I'm going like, oh no, oh my gosh, this is being. How do I live in the, this nightmare when it happens to me? Because it does from time to time. <laughs> <laughs> do you use any technical colleagues or professional sources to help validate technical accuracy of writing? Uh, I can start that one off because it's easy to answer for me. No, because I don't have any peers at the moment. Um, I'm still experimenting in this space. I did come across some interesting uh, red tape that I'm reading at the moment that's giving me uh, more clarity and better equipment and, um, or better writing skills. But I'm still, I don't have peers yet. Not yet.
Um, we're always interested in, in finding out um, the impact on uh, small to medium-sized businesses um, in, in particular. And it's very difficult to actually get at that kind of information because at the moment, in the UK anyway, um, businesses don't like to talk about breaches and they, they don't want to admit that they've had one. And it's seen as a sign of weakness still within the culture. Um, so we work very closely with a local cyber resilience police unit um, who have a number of these stories that people are willing to share. Um, and we find that's really, really useful because a lot of the audiences we're in front of sort of don't really think this stuff happens because they never hear about scenarios that relate to them. They hear about the big stories, um, you know, they, 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 they read the headlines, um, but there's a real sense that, yeah, but that, it's always the big companies that get hit, isn't it? It's never really people like us, because uh, the stories aren't around. So I would suppose that that's how I'd answer that question, that, that we work with local police units, um, to try and pull out some stories that people are able to relate to. Yeah, I would tend to agree with that. Um, dealing, as I said, in, in my hobbies, I guess, because it's not really my, my regular job, we're dealing with telecom, and five years ago there were big stories, AT&T and other stuff all over the place with Al-Qaeda and other names in it. And in the last five years, people are not mentioning it anywhere in the Western world. It does not appear mm -hmm. in the press. Cyber does, telecom doesn't. Mm -hmm. uh, and for us, it's like any little mom and pop house can get hit with a twenty-five thousand dollar, twenty thousand pound hit over a weekend, mm. uh, and it's happening a lot, but nobody talks about it. Yeah. Um, so, kind of using the fiction as a way to scare people and getting them to think about things. Uh, to go back to David's comment about Star Trek, a lot of the stories were meant about a reflection of the real world that was going on, sticking it in the future so you could pretend it was something different. And this is kind of what we have to do in uh, the fiction is depict these things real enough so people will get the clue, uh, but actually think about it, not automatically turn it off going, no, no, it couldn't happen to me. Yeah, yeah. And that's so interesting because um, every now and again, uh, we do get a news feature, which is about telecom scams. And it's always shocking um, because nobody's thought about it for three or four months, you know. Um, and, and you're right, you know, it doesn't get the airtime. And so you do get this kind of, this, you know, this ninja kind of psychology of, oh, no, but I'm fine. No, it's not really going on at the level I'm operating in. Which is unfortunate because, as you say, it, it's out there, it happens, and people just hmm. aren't aware of it. Yeah. Yeah, it's, it's kind of how I probably stumbled across it. Uh, it became very personal to me. Uh, someone I liked uh, was caught up in a storyline, and that's kind of how uh, I, I found a, a, a lot of the information that I, I write about out there. Um, and that, that's probably about the only time I've really assisted law enforcement with this, um, because in my country, they struggle to open up an Excel document. So uh, I really had to step in there and assist them. I like to do my own research on it, uh, where, again, most of the time since I'm showing, not telling, I, I can get away with, say, a broad stroke. At the same time, I want to make sure that absolutely zero of my characters are doing anything that's Hollywood technology. If they're going to use an IP address, it's going to be one that follows the actual proper format. They're not going to have weird numbers pop up in there. Uh, and my characters are not going to have a screen where they punch in a name and then blee, 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 you know, runs through 500 pictures, then ding, ding, here's the right one. No, uh, it'll be instead that my, my characters read Wireshark output. They will go through the code line by line and find the line that doesn't have the correct parentheses in it. I, it they're going to type ping and get responses. Uh, I even like to take screen output. If, if there's a command that I, I can have a character run, I'll 
try to run it in my home lab or something and then just copy and paste the screen output. So it, it is exactly what you see is exactly what my characters see. Uh, hopefully it's in an understandable way. But uh, and I also like to have it where they they start a program. And while they're waiting for it to start, there's an opportunity for some conversation because that's what I do. <laughs> you know, it, or, oh, geez, I had to reboot. Uh, let's go get some coffee. You know, then, you know, I, I want to put that natural flow and rhythm there. So if someone if, the, if I have a peer reading that, he's going to say, yeah, that happened to me four hours ago. Oh, my gosh. Yes, I rebooted something and went and got coffee. That's me. <laughs> um <laughs> And then at the, also at the same time for communications, uh, they'll send emails. They will send ch uh, text messages. They will use – actually, they don't like using Skype because if they're doing something mean and evil, they don't want that to follow them. Uh, but you know, having, having that ability to be a real technical situation – I, I, I draw a lot of my own experience from there. So not a whole lot of CSI tech, and that and that kind of you know that no. uh, thirty second solution, and that that leads into a good uh, another good question, which is so when everybody's writing, you know, do you ever incorporate uh, brands or or well known products or solutions into your writing? Uh, to make things a little bit more believable or because something's uh, very specialized. Uh, someone mentioned uh, The Matrix earlier, and I remember when that movie came out, I think NMAP was used, and it was, uh, uh, for the people in the know at the time, it was it made that part of the movie a little bit more believable. Uh, do, do any of you use something similar in your own works? Personally, since I'm working 150 plus years out in the future, no. Um, brands, some brands make sense to, to put in. It's like uh, I've actually turned Google into a verb rather than a company, but otherwise, no. The, the, the product, the, the market, the technology will all have changed enough that I don't anticipate it being appropriate. Um, for me, it depends on, on the context. Um, I will often say things like uh, Romulan built an advanced criminal social engineering network to hack Starfleet. Uh, it's better than saying Fred and Wilma are agents pushing a front company for Acme Solutions to run advanced social engineering psyops on Steve. So um, I, I just tend to uh, I, I just change the name of the brand to something that's fantastical. But generally, if someone understands the storyline, they'll they'll get they'll be able to read through the memes. And it, uh, from my point of view, we don't the the people are always the solution um, in the scenarios we're dealing with, and it, it just wouldn't be appropriate to use brands um, in the work that we do. Yeah, if it's if it's open source and freely available then that also means there's no legal team that will knock on my door. So, yeah, we'll mention that. Nmap, Wireshark, you got it. Ping, let's do this. Uh, but if it's going to be an actual logoed product, I'm going to create a brand. I'm not going to have the Toyota Motor Cor Corporation. It'll be the Toyota. It will not be the... Ford Motor Corporation, it'll be the Nord Motor Corporation. Uh, what kind of switches are they running there? Uh, they're Schmisco. Uh, you know, now, there may be a little, oh, okay, he's talking about somebody else, but I, I, at the same time, I don't want to bender bash in my fiction. Uh, I think that's unprofessional. And I think that security problems are going to be ones that every every manufacturer, every vendor has to face. So let's not get caught up in who did what to who, <laughs> let's, let's look at the issue that could be global and universal. I think that's the other part of it. If I make it global, if I make it universal through fudging on the brand names, then we don't have to get hung up in 
someone thinking, well, my vendor wouldn't have that happen because you know, you know, I use Arista switches and he's clearly bashing Cisco switches. Like, well, hold on there, you know, <laughs> you know hold on there. Um, and of course, there's also just the issue of legality. I don't. I'd rather not have to have a discussion with an attorney about a cease and desist order and try to explain that. I'm actually writing a parody, and this is fair use, or well, if I just avoid that entirely, then I just stay out of that minefield, which in, implies that, yes, I've actually stepped into it before. <laughs> I, you, back in my early days, you could I could post things on the internet, and uh, the attorney for such a corporation found it. And uh, I, I always enjoy getting a good cease and desist letter from a lawyer that has a sense of humor. I will say that. I don't like them, but I will enjoy them when I get them. So. <laughs> <laughs> uh, one last question then, and then I think we'll, uh, we'll go ahead and wrap up. Uh, what is the one thing that each of you has written uh, that, you, that frightens you the most? I'd like to jump in here because um, I think what's really interesting with as we've been talking is that we are dealing in the nightmares of our age. And that's a really strange place to be writing in. Uh, and it's not one that I thought about before. So I just want to thank everybody on the panel for making me think about that. Um, but um, we have a nightmare piece that, that we use that, and it's bespoke for businesses who are particularly trying to get the board on board. So very often we've got security professionals saying, we know we need to do this, but it's not, it's not a, a priority for the board. So we've created this piece that we now know, we call it the board's nightmare. And what we do is we create um, a fictional breach. We uh, use our associates, um, our technical associates to create a fictional breach. We take all the information that we can find about that particular company. And we create a breach which is, you know, believable to them. And then we set up um, and we script a news interview between the CEO of that company. And uh, I always play Kirsty Walk, who in the UK is one of the scariest uh, news um, interviewers. And we play out the news interview as if it was on a high profile news program. Um, it always frightens me because I'm always involved in scripting these um, scenarios. It frightens me what could happen to the companies that, that we are dealing with. But that is nothing to what it does to the board when we put it in front of them. Um, and suddenly being out there in that talk talk scenario, you know, having to explain a breach that you didn't see coming is really scary territory. Uh, for businesses. And it's great because actually a conversation starts once they've seen that particular nightmare scenario, um, which is always about, right, how do we move forward now? What do we need to do? And I think it works because it's so specific. We're not standing there saying, you know, this happens to companies like you. This is happening in the fintech sector. Da, 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 da. Um, and we're not saying that. We're saying we're using the details. Um, the company is woven into the disaster scenario and they are looking into a future that they don't want to have to think about or comprehend. They want to deal with that and make sure that never happens. So that's the nightmare, the version of the nightmare that we work with. That's a powerful um, scenario. It, it is. I mean, it's, it, it's always scary to do. Uh, because you start off with an audience that are probably not very engaged, um, but by the end, you've got everybody sitting forward, taking note. And that's a really exciting use of theatre, I think, as well, and because it makes it so immediate and it makes it a possibility rather than something a buzzing in people's ears. Um, from my personal perspective, what frightens me the most is that I'm not writing enough fiction, um, and that that, that maybe a, a storyline like The Matrix becomes a little bit uh, too true, and it's not a future I, I'm really looking forward to, so I'd rather try and head us towards a more Starfleet type of direction. So yeah, and that's what pretty much what frightens me the most, is that I'm not writing enough fiction. 
honestly, nothing I've written scares me because, like I said, I'm avoiding it. Um, sort of a cop-out uh, on that one. It's just I'd rather not see my nightmares become reality, so I tend to avoid that. I think that's where I'm, I'm really quite quite lucky um, in terms of the work that I'm, I'm putting out. And as we've said before, the fact that I've got the audience there in front of me. Because what I always leave really heartened, when, particularly when I've done a workshop with a, a group of people within a business. And um, because after we've dealt with the nightmares, there's a real urge and passion on the part of people who confront these things as, as part of their daily lives um, to do something about it, to, to make, make it better, to spread the word, to find solutions. And, um, you know, I, I, I have great faith that the nightmare, the worst nightmares that we envisage at this moment won't come about. Um, but we do need to, to, to realize that we're all part of it. And I'm not sure that we're managing that very well at a high-end level at the moment. Uh, what one thing have you written that uh, frightens you most? Ah, yeah. <laughs> um, it, the, the, I think there's just so much of working out my personal fears in these that I think the ones where something happens that the characters are powerless to do anything about as it happens where, for example, if you're driving your car, you want to believe that you control your own destiny and that if you get drunk, well, you just ruined yourself. But if you're in, the, if you're in a different car and there's a drunk driver next to you, you're not in control of that. That's, oh my gosh, that's the unknown. That's fear. Now, what do you do if the computer that's running this automated traffic system has a failure? If it has a buffer overload condition, if it has a you know out of out of memory allocation, what you some kind of error, what happens then if the computer itself is behaving like a drunk driver for 1,130 cars per minute that are going through on each lane of traffic on an eight-lane uh, all automated vehicle traffic zone? Now we don't have one or two cars involved in a small crash on interstate, you know, whatever. It's several hundred cars. There's a massive body count. It's like, it, it'll be as bad as an airplane crash. And it will be, this is something that we, brought, we bring on ourselves. In exchange for fewer single accidents, we're going to now increase the number of really bad accidents a lower death toll overall on the roads, it's just that the way that the deaths are arranged are now much more pointed and dramatic. Do you want to be caught up in that? <laughs> Do you want to be in a situation where you're sitting around and you, you're expecting your computer systems around you to behave themselves and then they hit a logic patch that suddenly it doesn't know what to do and you realize, oh no, the programmers didn't foresee this situation, and then blam, you have a disaster. That's that's what I want to keep coming back to, and that, that's what I think are the are the scary situations in which there is loss of life, uh, loss of health, due to we're trying to make our world better for ourselves, but at the same time we're blind to the way in which we could be sowing the seeds for that world's destruction with that very technology. That's the terrifying part. All right. Good well, question. No, that, that, is, uh, that is all the time that we have for the panel today. Uh, I'd like to thank the, the panelists uh, for their participation and for their fantastic answers. And we look forward to the next panels.
Well, thank you very much, and thank you for moderating. And I just loved hearing everybody's responses. It's been fascinating.